Hi and welcome from the Swiss Alps. During the last week I have been shooting quite a bit in the Swiss mountains and the reason is lying here before me and that's the new Canon RF 200-800mm f6.3 to f9. It has been very long awaited. A telephoto lens from Canon that is cheaper than the RF 100 to 500 and at the same time provides a bit more focal length, a competitor to the Sony 200 to 600 mm or the Nikon Z 180 to 600 mm if you want. And this lens is dead and still it's somehow a bit different. On the plus side, we have 200 mm more on the long end. On the other side, the maximum aperture is also a bit slower. It's smaller, letting less light in. And this was causing quite some discussions on online forums about if this lens is actually usable in low light, how the background rendition will look like. And I was really testing this lens quite intensively now. I did some studio tests to look the, at the sharpness of the lens because it's a non-L lens. Um, and then also uh, I want to show you some examples from the fields in terms of sharpness, uh, image stabilization, autofocus and address the elephant in the room with this f9 if this is a problem and if yes in which situation and in which situations you should not worry too much about it. When I picked the lens up for the very first time, I was actually surprised how light it feels. It weighs just over two kilograms and is therefore a bit lighter than the 180 to 600 millimeter from Nikon. That is also a very popular lens. Um, it's 31.4 centimeters long and 10.2 centimeters wide. So again, just a tiny bit less than the Nikon. And if I zoom here from 200 to 800 millimeter, you can see that it's an external zoom, meaning the tubus is extending. I'm not the biggest fan of the design, how it gets a bit bigger here, but I also think the design is not so important. This lens has this wide finish, which makes it look quite professional, but still it's not an L-line lens. So you can see that here in front, we don't have this red ring. It's instead a kind of a gray one. Um, but anyway, it's still protected against dust and splash water to a certain degree, of course. Um, we have the zoom ring that I just showed you. Um, behind we have the ring that sets the friction of the zoom, so how easy or hard it is to turn the zoom. Then we have two function buttons here, which have the same function, it's just one for vertical, one for horizontal shooting. You can configure it in the camera. Then we have a switch here for AF, control and MF. So you might wonder what is this control function? Well, this lens doesn't have a dedicated manual focus ring. It has a combined control and focus ring, like we also know it from some less expensive lenses like the RF uh, 50mm 1.8. And this means that this ring here has a double function and here you can basically assign if you want to use it for the control or if you go to AF, um, you can use it to manually interfere with the autofocus. Like if the autofocus is stuck on the background, you can quickly turn it here and bring the focus closer. So I always left it on AF because I don't, I always want to be able to quickly uh, yeah, change the focus manually. I'm not the biggest fan of the design, to be honest. I know Nikon did the same with the 180 to 600. Uh, it's not that I need this control ring. This would be fine if it would not have it, but this ring is rather small. It's a bit far behind. I need to really stretch my thumb to reach it if I'm shooting normally, especially if it's a bit extended. I tend to hold it like this and then it's a bit annoying to go back here. And it also has quite some friction or resistance, which totally makes sense for a control ring to not too easily override your settings. But for a focus ring, I would wish it was a bit smoother. Um, and then below there we have the stabilizer. Also new, we only have an on and off, another mode one, two or three. So I'm not 100% sure if the camera kind of decides to, or kind of figures this out on its own, whether you're panning or not. The tripod color is very nicely designed in my opinion. So you can just loosen it here and turn it around. It doesn't come off completely. And I think with a lens of this size, it in my opinion also makes sense. Uh, I like that the tripod foot is quite large. So um, I can easily reach the zoom ring like this. And if I um, kind of uh, carrying the lens for a longer while, I really found that like this, it sits very well in the hand and I can carry it like this. 
as you can see you can also attach your um, basically the neck neck strap around here in these through these openings but i i did this in the beginning and never used it anymore because it's just so easy to hold it like this when walking through the forest the lens has a varying minimum focus distance. It goes from uh, 0.8 meters at 200 millimeter to 3.3 meters at 800 millimeter. The maximum magnification is uh, 0.25, so 1 to 4 at 200 millimeters. So in the US, the lens costs around $1,900, which is around $200 more than the Nikon Z180 to 600, which I think is a quite direct competitor. But we also need to think that this one actually offers 200 millimeter more focal length. So let's talk about image quality and I would say we start with some indoor studio tests um, that I did in my apartment. I think the shooting distance was between 7 and 8 meters and I did the test at several focal length, always in the center of the image and at the edge of the image. We start with 200 millimeters wide open at f6.3 and you can see that the center is quite nice and sharp. On the edge of the image, you can see that it's noticeably darker because of this vignetting effect that we have. Sharpness is still good, but we see some small chromatic aberration. Even though I would not worry too much, this can be probably corrected quite easily. But I wanted to show you here the raw files without any sharpening or corrections applied. If we stop down by two thirds to f8, we see that uh, we don't gain much in sharpness because it was already very sharp before, but the chromatic aberrations uh, get a tiny bit less not much, but a tiny bit better. And we see that we have noticeably more light in the edge of the frame. If we zoom into 300 millimeters, we have an open aperture of f7.1. Again, both look very sharp. And now I see basically no chromatic aberrations anymore and the edge of the frame. If we stop down at f9, again, we get more light at the edge of the frame and maybe a tiny bit more sharpness. But in the center of the image, to be honest, I really don't see any difference. Then I zoomed in a bit more to 500 millimeter and here I did a small mistake. The maximum aperture at 500 millimeters is f8, not at f9. Uh, I did a mistake here. What I did later, like two days later, was a comparison um, of f8 and f9 at 500 millimeters and I basically didn't see any difference. So I will leave it here, but keep in mind, maybe at f8 you have ever so slightly less sharpness, but I could not tell the difference. If we start here at the center of the image, it looks really crisp and sharp. Um, at the edge of the frame, it's also very sharp. I would say slightly softer, but no chrom uh, chromatic aberration or anything. And if we stop down to f11, uh, in the center of the image, again, I cannot see any difference. In the edge of the image, we maybe get a tiny bit more sharpness and again, a bit more light, but the difference is very small. Finally, let's zoom in to 800 millimeters. Uh, here we have a maximum aperture of f9 and the image in the center is still very sharp. And here, I think for the first time, we really see that we lose a bit in sharpness towards the edge of the frame, but it's still not bad. And if we stop down to f11, the center still looks basically the same. At the edge of the frame, I'm not sure if we gain sharpness, but we again notice that the vignetting is kind of disappearing or at least getting heavily reduced. I also put the 1.4 extender and did some tests. So at 1120 millimeters, we have a maximum aperture at f13. And now we start seeing a bit of a loss in image quality, but I think it's still very sharp in the middle at f13. Towards the edge of the frame, we see that we lose a bit of sharpness. Not too bad, but we lose a bit. Uh, if we stop down to f16, I'm Again, not sure if we really gain something in the edge of the frame. Yes, a bit more light, but in terms of sharpness, I don't really think so. So I think in practice, I'm not sure if I would bother stopping down to f16 just for the purpose of sharpness. Depth of field is of course something else. And speaking of in the field, how did it perform there? Uh, in short, amazing. I was really surprised it delivered consistently very, very sharp images, uh, at least on my R5, on the R10, it was a bit less consistent, but I, again, I think this is something more to do with the R10. On the R5, it was very good. Even with the extender, it was working well in terms of sharpness. With the extender, I saw some slight chromatic operation from time to time, but still okay. Um, and I was really surprised because I shot side by side also with the RF 100 to 500. And honestly, this lens it's sometimes a bit uh, amazing that this is a non-L lens because it performs really well and it has excellent sharpness. 
and even with the R10 you can still get sharp images also with the 1.4 extender you can for example see this uh, portrait of a cormoran um, taking 1120 millimeters f14 you can see here the raw file and after then I quickly denoised and sharpened it a bit and I think the final file looks, looks really good and in my opinion sharp enough so you can get these sharp shots I just felt like it's a bit less consistent it doesn't always work I needed to do more bursts of shots to have one that was really good enough so how was the autofocus performance with this lens well in short it was excellent the autofocus is very fast, it's precise, and it's not like hunting for focus like I had it with some cheaper lenses. For example, with the RF 800mm f11, I had this sometimes that not every picture was sharp, but some were slightly blurry. And here, this was on a whole other level. So, really happy with the autofocus performance. Also, with the 1.4 extender, it still worked very well. At least when I was using the R5, with the R10, I really felt that the autofocus performance dropped, especially when using the tele extender. But in general, the, I felt that the R10 is not as consistent with the autofocus than my R5 is, uh, independent of the lens. I never really use this lens on a tripod, I just prefer to shoot handheld. And I need to say that the image stabilizer was a great help here. It worked very, very good. Um, I was shooting, for example, this uh, tit here at 1120 millimeters handheld with one eightieth of a second. And as you can see, the image is really sharp. The only problem was sometimes that the tit was moving. But if you have a subject that is rather stationary, you can really handhold uh, quite a bit. And that's definitely an advantage um, because especially with the extender uh, maximum aperture of f13 if you shoot in a forest this can mean that you really don't have much light that reaches the sensor so i'm very happy about this excellent image stabilizer i was also shooting some video and here i was a bit spoiled in the last uh, weeks or months when i was using nikon because they have really an excellent image stabilizing system and i was also very happy with this one i just noticed that it takes a few seconds until it really kicks in in the video mode um, but I think this is more a Canon, general Canon thing. And afterwards, after these few seconds, it was very, very smooth and very steady. You can see this uh, video of this chamois that I took handheld. Um, I shot in slow motion, but I didn't stabilize in post or anything. And it was 1,120 millimeters. Quite impressive, right? So how well was the overall performance with the tele extender? Um, you can use both the 1.4 and the 2-point tele-extender, but I only have the 1.4, so I only tested with this one. But with that one, it's really amazing. So first of all, what's really cool, you have the full range from 200 to 800 millimeter, and you have the full autofocus area, at least with the 1.4. I'm not sure about the two times. I could imagine that it's a bit tighter there, but this I just don't know. The autofocus was still very fast, very accurate. You felt a slight drop, but what is, it was still very usable, again, at least with the R5. I just felt that with the R10, there was a bit more, um, I had a bit more blurry shots. And to be honest, I would not use the tele extender with a crop camera, I think, too much, especially when you don't have a lot of light available. Otherwise, I was very happy. What I realized a bit was that with the 1.4 extender, I got a bit more chromatic aberrations, but this was very easy to correct with Capture One, so I would not worry too much about it. So what about the low light capabilities and the background blur? Because this was something I think that many people were concerned. So let's start first with the low light. Um, yes, with F9, you often reach higher ISO if you shoot in a dark forest or on a heavily overcast day and if you use the 1.4 extender, obviously it gets worse. However, you have a very good image stabilizer. If your subject is not moving too fast, this can already help a bit to just use a slower shutter speed and decrease the ISO as well. Just be careful not to get blurry shots because the subject moves. The second thing is nowadays we have amazing AI tools. So I was using DxO Pure or 3 quite a lot. Um, and you can see here the processed image and I basically don't lose any detail and the noise almost disappeared. If you're interested, I put a link in the video description so you can test it out for free. What about the background blur? So I need to say in the lower range, 200 to 300 millimeter, it's really a bit challenging to get a smooth out of focus background. Between 400, 500, maybe 600 millimeter, it really depends on the situation. Sometimes it can work very well. If you have larger subjects, it's still a bit tricky. Between 600 and 800 millimeters, on the other hand, it was fairly easy actually to get a 
a smooth background, especially when shooting smaller subjects like some tits or other songbirds. And here I also want to mention that if you compare it to a Nikon 180 to 600 millimeters, at 600 millimeters you have an advantage with a Nikon because you have f6.3, whereas here you have f8. And this difference, yeah, you can see it. It's not dramatic, but you see it. However, with the Nikon, if you use the 1.4 extender, you get to 840 uh, millimeters f9 and here you have 800 millimeters f9 so there you have basically the same uh, background blur but you have the advantage here that you don't need to put in the extender and the performance is much much better here i really felt this difference and as always i think almost more important than the maximum f-stop of the lens is how you as a photographer work with the background, work with different compositions, different shooting angles and so on. If you're interested, I wrote an ebook about bird photography and there are some tips about how to get a smooth background, I will link it below. So what are my conclusions? Can I recommend this lens? I think for people that just started into bird or wildlife photography in general or want to get a bit more serious, also shoot often a bit more shyer subjects, I think this is an amazing lens. You have a huge zoom range from 200 to 800 millimeter. That's a four times zoom. If you look at the competitors, Nikon, uh, Sony, they have three times zoom or a bit more. So here you're really more flexible. You don't need to use the tele extender as often, but you can still use it. It takes it incredibly well. Uh, I think one downside is sometimes, again, especially in the lower to mid range, the maximum aperture so this can make it a bit harder to uh, have a really smooth background so it depends if this is important for you and if we look what else there is around for Canon mirrorless cameras you can always adapt a, a Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter contemporary I tested this and I need to say it's like a whole different league this lens the autofocus is so much better image quality is better stabilizer is better it's so much more fun to use believe me so Honestly, even if it costs twice as much as the Sigma, I would definitely go for this one. Otherwise, there is the RF 100 to 400, but that's much shorter, has a much worse background renditioning, much less background blur. So I think this is really only if you want to have something smaller for closer subjects and you are maybe also on a tighter budget. There is one other lens from Canon. That is very interesting as well and kind of competes a bit with this one. And that's the RF 100-500mm to f4.5 to 7.1 and it's an L lens. It's much lighter, it's uh, much smaller and I think it's very interesting because at least where I live in Switzerland at the moment with the cashback, the RF 100-500mm to is actually cheaper than this one. And it definitely has some advantages but also some disadvantages. So I will do a new video, a separate video in around two weeks or so, um, where I compare the 100 to 500 to the 200 to 800 in the field with the tele extenders and also some studio tests. So make sure to subscribe to the channel, activate the notifications and see you soon.